good. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Just to let you know, this session is recorded um, for anyone who at home and is gonna put their camera on at any point. I just wanna give you the heads up for that. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Crystal Jacob. I am a member of the Lois Hall Hospital for Women's, Women's Society. I am part of our development committee and steering committee. So, and I'm super excited to be co-hosting tonight's session. So for those of you who don't know, the Lois Hall Hospital um, Women's Society is a group of women in all ages and stages of life who are passionate and committed to raising excellence in women's healthcare and treatment. The Women's Society raises awareness and important funds for a variety of initiatives at the Lois Hall Hospital for Women. Um, and we host our mind and body talks as a way to um, get involved with our community and keep everyone engaged. Um, it's a free of charge series, so we love having all of these names show up and sign up. It's um, a great way to just communicate and it's a very safe and open place. So if anyone has any questions or suggestions, we are totally open to hearing them. If um, you would love to become a part of our society or a donating member, we would love that as well. And you can sign up through our website or you can contact any of us who are on the committees. So um, just a few housekeeping notes for tonight. Um, tonight our speakers will be Chris O'Neill and Mike Newton. They are two members of Edmonton Fire Rescue Service and the founders of Med Talks Incorporated. And they will both be presenting on emergency cardiovascular health and stress. Um, we're going to split the talk up into four sections, and we will have time for some ge general discussion as well. So after each section, we're going to do a question and answer period. Um, if you would like to ask a question, you can look at the little reactions down at the bottom of your screen, um, and you can do a thumbs up, and uh, I think there's a hand wave as well. Um, and then I will message you directly and you can put your camera on and ask the question directly. Or um, you can always ask a question in our chat as well and we will get to all of those. Um, also, there is two settings in Zoom. So there is the gallery view and the speaker view. Um, and tonight we recommend that you use the speaker view so that you don't miss anything um, that Chris and Mike are going to be presenting on. Um, so that's it for housekeeping, but we, before we get started, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to Alberta Blue Cross for their continuous support for us to be running these series. Um, and Ashley is going to be bringing some greetings from Alberta Blue Cross for us. Thank you so much, Crystal. Yeah. Well, hi, everyone. Um, we are so proud to partner with the Hospital Women's Society to bring you these talks. And I know I am speaking for the entire Alberta Blue Cross team when I say how, that we're so excited to be here. I am not alone in saying that these past few months have not been without stress, and now more than ever, being mindful of our health and wellness is so important. Of all the talks I attended last year, uh, I had the most fun at this one, and so you're all in for a real treat tonight. I, tr I am truly looking forward to learning more about cardi cardiovascular health and stress with Mike, Chris, and all of you in attendance tonight. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ashley. Um, so now, uh, without further ado, I will introduce our speakers for this evening. So first we have Mike Newton. Mike is a senior firefighter and senior medical training officer with Edmonton Fire Rescue Service. He started his firefighting career in 2007 after several years as a professional athlete and educator with social services. Mike is a coordinator with the International Trauma and Life Support Alberta Chapter, and an advanced first aid instructor through Nate's Medical First Responder Program, as well as the Canadian Red Cross, and a basic life support instructor with the Heart and Stroke Foundation. He's also nationally recognized as a volunteer with HSF. Mike has developed several training programs used by Edmonton Fire Rescue for new recruits and existing members. Um, and his counterpart and partner in crime, Chris O'Neill, is an FFQ and most senior medical training officer with Edmonton Fire Rescue Service. So Mike started his firefighter career in 2006 
and previously was trained um, as an EMT. Chris is a coordinator with the International Trauma and Life Support Alberta chapter, an advanced first aid instructor, as well as instructor trainer with Canadian Red Cross. He is an instructor trainer with Heart and Stroke Foundation. And Chris is also part of a small team developing a brand new 80 hour required course needed by all firefighters um, in Edmonton Fire Rescue. Chris founded Vital Health Medical Education over 10 years, which he does in-house medical training in the Edmonton area as well. Um, and then as you've probably seen, um, our talk is going to be also kind of hosted by Med Talks. So what Med Talks is, is it's a program that was founded by Mike and Chris in 2018. And it's a group of active emergency healthcare workers, including firefighters, paramedics, psych psychiatric nurses, and combat medics that provide a large emergency health presentations and workshops for pri private and public businesses. Um, MedTox also provides in-house certified medical training, such as standard first aid, CPR, and ba basic life support in the medical industry and non-medical industries in accordance with OHNS requirements. Um, and the goal for MedTox has, is to make emergency medical information accessible and in plain language while using light humor to bring attention to current health issues. And I can definitely vouch for the light humor. Um, you guys are gonna love the talk tonight. These two are great together. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna let Chris and Mike take it from here. Thank you, Crystal. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, Chris, are you, are you there? I'm here. Uh, how you doing? Uh, pretty good. Uh, a little nervous, to be honest. Uh, I wouldn't worry about it. I actually don't think anyone's here to see you, so no pressure. Um, oh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to start tonight off, though, by thanking everyone for braving these cold winter roads to be here with us tonight. Um, we'll start with our housekeeping, and honestly, I had a little script written out that Looks like Crystal pretty much hit all of, so thank you. This is gonna be an awkward couple minutes, but um, just to build on those points then, Chris and myself do use humor as a teaching tool pretty often, but in no way do we actually find medical emergencies or their victims to be funny. Um, we're simply just trying to lighten the mood around some pretty heavy hitting topics uh, and maybe make them a little bit more accessible. That being said, um, if there are any complaints, um, I would encourage you to write them out in that little chat box. And then what you can do is take that little chat box bubble and click and drag it over to that little file folder. It looks like a garbage can on your screen. Uh, park them there and we'll kind of move on. So again, our format for tonight, like Crystal said, is we have four separate kind of sections we're gonna present. Um, think of them more as excerpts from larger talks that we do. Um, so if you feel like we breezed over anything, um, it's simply due to time constraints. Um, and again, at the start of every section, we'll do some kind of interactive question, um, sort of just test everyone's general knowledge about some of these um, topics. And then at the end of each section, we will handle a couple questions. Um, so again, our, our topics, the flow for tonight, Chris is going to start off by talking about some heart attack information. Um, then I will present on some information regarding stroke followed by stress manifestations. And the idea there, the link, uh, so, so when, we, when we say things like stress can make your head explode or your heart to tap out, you'll kind of know what we're talking about. Uh, and then to finish off, Chris will kind of close it all out by talking about some mental health first aid. Um, any time that we do have left at the end, um, we'll open up to any sort of candid conversation or questions that you might have surrounding the presentation. Um, our backgrounds as firefighters or first responders or medical educators, uh, even working as first responders during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, knowing Chris though and how long-winded he can be, I'm predicting right now that there's probably not gonna be a lot of time left at the end. Um, but on a serious note, just a little bit more background about us um, before we get going. Quickly, I wanted to kind of just share how special it actually is for us to be here on behalf of the Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society. Um, my experience started with the Lois Hole Hospital shortly after it opened in 2010. 
and has kind of continued throughout the years to today. Um, in that time, I've experienced uh, a miscarriage that needed treatment at the lowest hole. Um, we've experienced the death of a son at the lowest hole, and we also experienced the birth of a daughter at the lowest hole hospital. Um, and I just wanted to kind of say that the care that we received at the hospital was nothing less than excellent in treatments for our bodies, for our souls, the compassion of the staff and the volunteers and how they make connections with their patients are so unique and so amazing. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's, it's really just an honor to be presenting for a second time fumbling through another presentation. Um, so at this point, I'm going to turn things over to Chris and he can share some of his experience and he'll get our night started. So thank you. It's about time. Okay. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, as mentioned by both Crystal and Mike, I'm Chris. Um, Crystal, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, you did actually forget the one part. I, I don't know why. I, maybe I sent that email to Amber. Uh, maybe got lost. But just the the fact that like I'm the star of the show. I'm I'm a little bit more of the the main act. And just you were supposed to mention about how Mike's my little sidekick. He's my little side act and everything. But I, I'm sure everybody's everybody's going to figure that out by the end. So don't worry about it. We'll we'll get through it. Um, but thank you again for the for the intro, um, and thank you to all of you for joining us. Um, in all seriousness, as as Mike said, like we are very honored to be here. We are very excited to be here. Admittedly, a little bit confused why everybody wants to tune in and listen to a couple simple firefighters talk about some medical stuff. But uh, we are very grateful for the opportunity. Um, just going to start this off, and you'll have to excuse my uh, process here to get over to my shared screen one sec we're going to start this off with some heartwarming photos and there we go oh sorry one more time here there you go can you tell i'm nervous i'm stumbling through this already there we go there, there they are. So speaking of things that I am grateful for, there are my three little monsters, uh, all boys. So as you can probably tell, my wife and I are, are very busy. Uh, in an effort to make this short, uh, just to share my experience with the, the Lowe's Hole Hospital for Women, um, I just want to mention that uh, our first two pregnancies were fairly straightforward. Uh, although, other than the fact that they were both like 10 pounders, and the second one did leave us down the path of, of having an emergency C-section for my wife. Uh, but both those experiences did not prepare us for our, our number three. Uh, early into our third pregnancy, we discovered it would be high risk. Um, we, uh, we found by ultrasound that uh, my wife had a full placenta previa. Uh, it's a condition that means that the placenta completely blocks or covers the cervix. Um, and can cause or has the potential to cause severe and uncontrollable bleeding, um, not only during the delivery, but pregnancy as well. At 24 weeks, we landed ourselves in the emergency room. Uh, we did about a week stint in the hospital. Uh, we were very thankful to be at the Royal Alex. Uh, we gained access to the antenatal team who then made daily visits to our home as my wife spent three months on, on complete bed rest. Uh, that support continued throughout our process with OB appointments at least once to twice a week, uh, ultrasounds once a week, iron IV therapy for my wife, uh, and various other, various other lab work and appointments. Um, our littlest guy arrived six weeks early, and after about two weeks in the NICU, we were finally able to go home with him. Um, now my wife is recovering. Um, she... Uh, She's doing really well. Uh, the new guy is absolutely thriving, and we owe a great deal of, of gratitude and success for that successful outcome to the Lowest Hole Women's Society uh, and the Lowest Hole uh, Hospital for Women. Um, I also do want to mention that a lot of this credit, um, telling my story and, and telling my story on behalf of my wife and I, is a lot of the credit goes to her. All of the credit goes to her, actually. Uh, she is a, a strong and incredible woman. Um, who has been through a lot and somehow conquers every single day. And uh, plus, now that it's all said and done, she has to live with four ginormous boys. And for those of you that saw the last picture and are keeping count, uh, I did include myself in those numbers. So um, so continue on with being grateful. Uh, just 
also uh, grateful for the opportunity to just to be able to say thank you to all the, the doctors, the nurses, the su support staff, everybody that goes into making the Lowell's Hole Hospital facility as amazing as it is, and to the LHH uh, Women's Society. Um, the work that you do is impactful. Um, I, I can speak to that from personal experience. It, it does make a difference, so thank you. Um, as we continue on, all the, the grateful Freeling train, uh, one other thing uh, I'm grateful for is my fourth child. Uh, there he is there. Uh, he's kind of like my problem child. He's the child that I always have to hold his hand and be on top of all the time and just basically constant supervision. Um, this is kind of an old picture, so just here's a, a newer one. There he is. So, Mike, buddy, I'm, I'm grateful for you as well most of the Thank time. You. Thanks, Chris. No problem. Even after all the nice things you just said about me. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, while I get myself set up here, as we mentioned, um, Rihanna, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, let's throw up some of those questions. It's just a little bit of a test your knowledge before we get started, and we'll uh, kind of see what everybody thinks and what everybody comes up with some answers before I do my spiel. That went seamlessly. There we go. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Okay. Mike, do we do this test too? I'm gonna. Yeah? I wrote the questions, but I'm not sure. They're pretty hard, actually. We'll see. They are hard. Yeah. They are hard. Do we have a phone a friend option? Uh, you can phone me if you want. No, I was thinking more like, I don't know, something smarter gonna... like Kurt Dell or something. Oh, I was going to go straight to voicemail anyway. Yeah, that's probably, oh, that's probably true. Everyone answer the question. Can everyone see them? Uh, I see them here. Okay, four people have answered. Uh, <laughs> I do not see them. You don't? No. Okay. Okay, now more people are answering. Okay, okay, that's fine. Maybe okay. I can't see them because I'm also the host, Rhiannon. So we'll just we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> okay, cool. Sorry to interrupt there. Panic all around. Panic all around. Now people are going. This is awesome. There we go. There okay. we go. Almost. We've got, I'll give like 10 more seconds maybe. Oh, I don't see them. Someone else didn't see them. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure how to. Okay. You know what? I'm going to end them and then we'll try and get it to work better next time. Yeah. And we have, we have more coming up. That's, that's fine. End yeah. polling. So are we sharing the results now or not? We'll save them till the end of this topic. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Okay. Uh, perfect. Okay, so uh, we're going to get started with ROSC. Now, to understand ROSC and some of the stats that I'll be talking about, it's important to understand two key terms. Uh, probably ones that you've heard of before, there's cardiac arrest and heart attack. The problem is, is those two terms are actually used quite commonly interchangeably together and uh, they're actually two big and completely different processes. So again, here I'll just share one thing. What's the problem with doing things on an iPad? All right. So, um, heart attack is essentially, it's a pipe problem. Uh, the heart, like everything else in the body, has its own, own pipe system, its own supply of oxygenated blood. Uh, when that heart has a stoppage in the oxygenated blood or there's a blockage in the pipes, this leads to a heart attack. Okay. But we're actually going to put a pin in that one. We're going to come back to heart attack. Um, but uh, we do need to answer about what is cardiac arrest. So cardiac arrest is more of an electrical problem with the heart. So there is an electrical malfunction in the heart that essentially throws it into a wacky rhythm and eventually the heart will stop, the breathing will stop, and there is death then. Okay, so now we're back. Everybody see me here, now we're back. Doing great, buddy. Thanks. Okay, so now that brings us back to Ross. So as first responders during a code or during a cardiac arrest, we may use the term ROSC if 
if we're lucky. Uh, ROSC is this return of spontaneous circulation. So essentially it's when people come back to life, their heart comes back and their breathing starts again. Um, so the first question in our poll was based around the scenario that if you were to drop in public or, or let's say even better yet, let's, if Mike was to drop in public and go into cardiac arrest, um, what is his chance of survival? What is his chance of ROSC? And not only what is that number, but why is the number that, and what can we do to maybe improve it? Okay. Uh, according to CanRock, Alberta statistics show that uh, ROSC is achieved in a pre-hospital setting 32% of the time. So some of you might be a little bit alarmed by maybe the number's pretty low, or maybe you think it's a little higher than what you thought. But if somebody drops in cardiac arrest, 32% of the time they're able to get brought back. Um, now, Mike and I are very passionate about teaching CPR, um, having that information get out there, very much so why we are doing this presentation tonight and, and honored to be here for, for that. Um, did you know that over 50% of cardiac arrests do not have any bystander CPR. So the skills are just not there, that knowledge is just not there, and nobody is able to do CPR. Um, just do it by doing compression only CPR can increase somebody's chance of survival or increase their chance of ROS all the way up to 43.9%. So that's a huge jump. Now in Seattle, they kind of have the gold standard for ROSC, if you will. They have implemented public programs that people can come in and learn compression-only CPR for free. And their ROSC that they've achieved over the number of years this program has been in place is 63%. So if you ever want to travel and feel safe, Seattle is probably a good place to kind of go. Okay, um, okay so let's, let's do what we can. So... Uh, just want to say that the heart is important. Uh, it works hard for us, and I think that we should show that gratitude and give a little bit of that appreciation back. Uh, so much so that I think, I really feel that the heart deserves a name. Now, if my heart had a name, it would be called Arnie, because it likes to pump, if that makes sense to everybody. So, my heart would have a name of Arnie, um, it's an important muscle, it works hard, and damn it, it deserves a name. The average heartbeat, for argument's sake, is about 80 beats a minute. So that is about 4,800 beats in an hour, 115,200 beats in a day. And if we are looking at over a year, you're at about 42,048,000. Now, the average lifespan or the average life expectancy in Canada is 80. So you would reach up to 3,363,840,000 heartbeats in a lifetime. Mike, why don't you check those numbers for me? Mike. Mike. Sounds about right, Chris. Yeah, numbers are good? Yeah. Thanks, buddy. Thanks for the backup there. Got it. Okay. Now, currently, life expectancy for a female in Canada is actually a range of 82 to 84. So that 80 comes from the guys bringing down the average. We're at about 74 uh, for our life expectancy. Um, so females' average heartbeat in a lifetime will actually be higher, and it will be 3,532,203,000 times. Now, do these numbers matter? Not really, because I'm actually telling you something that everybody already knows. In their lifetime, women work harder than men. Fair enough. I think everybody would agree with that. Okay. So what do the numbers, why do they really matter? Why, what are we talking about today? So we've, we're talking about the heart. We're talking about how important it is. And we're talking about how it has to be something that we focus on. Cardiovascular disease has become the leading cause of death globally and is projected to be the cause of death for 23.6 million people a year by the year 2030. Now, here in Canada, cancer is still the leading cause of death, but cardiovascular disease is a close second and is the leading cause of death in women over age 55. Now, talking about women, there's, there's some big factors that contribute to 
higher numbers in women than in men. Uh, one of the biggest things is that, um, uh, especially in women, that there is a lack of awareness around cardiovascular disease and that the signs and symptoms of a heart attack in the woman are missed 78% of the time. So we're gonna talk about those signs and symptoms. We're gonna talk about why they may be missed, but that's a huge number for us to overcome, okay? It's actually estimated that uh, a woman dies in Canada one or every 20 minutes, so from cardiovascular disease. In fact, every, peop every 10 people that die from, from a cardiac arrest or from a heart attack, six of them are women, okay? And yet two thirds of clinical research is actually still geared towards men. Right. Now, guys, we aren't looking great either. They estimate that every four years, there is an increase or a minimum increase of 35% of emergency visits due to heart attack in men ages 20 to 44. 20 to 44. That's a very low number. Right? Um, so let's bring some awareness and let's look at some signs and symptoms of a heart attack. One more time to bear with me here. All right. So uh, men will typically, uh, they will fit that, that typical signs and symptoms. So this is a man having a heart attack. Uh, men will have the chest pain, the clutching pain, the pressure feeling, that, that feeling that the pain is radiating up into the shoulder, the neck, the jaw, uh, down into the arm. Uh, they'll be they'll be dizzy. They'll be nauseous. Um, the other thing is that men are babies, essentially. As tough as we like to think we are, we really we're just a bunch of big babies. Uh, when we get chest pain, we whine, we cry, and it's honey, call nine one one. Honey, call the ambulance. Call the military. Call the Avengers. Honey, call my mom. And we whine and we cry, but we get help. The ambulance comes. We go to the hospital. So signs and symptoms for females, they can be similar, they can be the same, but women are, they're essentially, they're tougher than men. They perceive pain differently. So let's do one more here. All right. So this is typically a female who's having cardiac or, or heart attack, sorry. Um, this is this is literally kind of as we as we find them. They we walk in. They're nice and calm. They're sitting waiting for us. They're still nice and dressed up. They are talking to us politely, even apologizing that they called to say, "Oh, hey, like sorry to bother you with this." Okay. Uh, typically, women don't have time for chest pain. They got things to do. They're not going to look after themselves. They're not going to focus on themselves. They're going to worry about everybody else first. Okay. The other signs and symptoms that are more typical for women is unusual fatigue. So that fatigue is like a sudden exhaustion, like you just crank that dial right up. Very often they will get back pain with that chest pain. They'll have sudden shortness of breath, and it's not the shortness of breath that they are slowly walking up the stairs, work themselves into a jog, going up the stairs, they get shorter and shorter and shorter of breath. It's more like they just bolted to the top of the 50th story of this building, running up the stairs full tilt, and they're just there all of a sudden. Okay, so that's the sudden shortness of breath. The other thing that's typical that we see is heartburn for women. So very often what will happen is, is a female will get heartburn, she'll ignore it, she'll take some medications that are in the house, She'll go to bed, she'll push it off, push it off, push it off until it gets bad enough and turns into a kind of a cardiac arrest. So, um, so that kind of leads us into why is cardiovascular disease on the rise? Why are those numbers so high? Now, I'm not here to lecture everybody, thou shall not cheeseburger. Everybody's heard the whole thing of do not smoke. Everybody's heard the like eat right. Everybody's heard that you should exercise. Um, so basically, everybody should know to have no fun ever. Um, but I do want to tell you about a factor that is a little less common and is becoming the most common cause or con contributing factor to cardiovascular disease, and that is high blood pressure. Um, so it's also called hypertension. So what is hypertension? Hypertension is essentially our pipe problem. 
One sec here again. See my big hand in the way there. Okay, so uh, your vessels are like elastic pipes. They can expand and contract. Uh, they stretch like those elastic bands. Um, they can get bigger and they can come back to a normal size. Now, over time, there can be a buildup of fat and cholesterol that hardens and narrows those pipes. So think of your vessels as a four lane road uh, with normal traffic flow, everything's good. There's no problems, everything's flowing smoothly. If there's rush hour traffic and all of a sudden there's more cars on the road or there's an increased need, like you go for a run on the treadmill, your heart starts pumping harder. Those vessels or that road will actually expand to like a six lane road and then come back to four when that need is complete. Um, now again, with that buildup over time, what we see is that buildup of plaque. So not only does the plaque harden the vessels so that they can't open up, it can't expand into that four, five, six lane road, but it actually hardens so it can't stretch. And the buildup of plaque kind of filters everybody down into a one lane, okay? Um, next here. So, and as if the traffic isn't bad enough, here comes a blood clot, giant truck that just comes down the pipe and gets stuck in that plaque and has a complete blockage of flow to a part of the heart. Now, over time, the effects of hypertension or high blood pressure will cause serious damage um, to your heart and to your cardiovascular system. It's important to watch for the signs of high blood pressure and to the factors that cause it. Now, the big question is, does anyone know what the increased cause of blood pressure is. Anybody at all? Ah! Whoa! Mike! You're right. <sighs> yeah, I'm good. Yeah. Okay. I owed you, you one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <sighs> okay, everyone. That was Mike. Uh, Obviously answering our question here that stress is the number one factor to blood pressure uh, to contribute to cardiovascular disease. <sighs> Rhiannon, I'm, uh, I'm done with my section there. Maybe I'll uh, take a minute to compose myself and if you want to throw up that poll again and uh, we'll see how everybody did on these questions. All right, so we, we have some, some negative thinkers in the group, some 10%, so that's, you know, that's good. Okay, 40%, so yeah, definitely higher. Okay, yeah, good there. Good, so yeah, the, the big one there at the end, the, the you know, textbook signs of signs and symptoms, uh, women can experience them both, but, uh, they will have those special exceptions. I don't know who put when will it be Mike's turn to present. Mike, come on. All right. All right. Okay, so uh, I, here's the opportunity for everybody. If there's any questions on that section, uh, myself or Mike would be more than happy to kind of answer anything that comes up. No, everybody's just excited to hear Mike talk. Rhiannon, any hands going up? Not that I've seen. I'm not sure. I think it will tell me. Oh, there's a question in the chat box. Hold on. Question in chat box. What about the heart itself? Muscle disease? Question mark. Uh, I'm not 100% sure I understand the question, but um, just for for the disease to the muscle tissue, usually what's affected with cardiovascular disease is that muscle will grow, it will get thicker, and that's what causes some dysrhythmias over time to actually force it into that kind of uh, heart attack or that cardiovascular 
uh, problem with cardiac arrest. Okay, I've scrolled, oh, cardiomyopathy. Yeah, cardiomyopathy, there we go. See, I, I use less fancy terms. Thank you, Heather. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I, someone else is waiting in the waiting room, so I'm gonna let them in. Um, I don't see any other hands up. No, oh, that's, that's good. Yeah. Let's cool. get moving over to Mike. Perfect. I guess you covered the topic so well, Chris, that uh, you know, no questions, right? You got it. You were of course. Was that. there ever any doubt? Do you yeah. want me to do your section, Mike? I don't know. I'm actually pretty warm for you. know how hard it was to actually struggle into that costume? I had on backwards at one point. It was ridiculous. And then I was trying to pull the hood up and I was seeing nothing. I was worried that I was going to miss the whole cue. Anyway, I'm glad it worked out like it did. Um, so thanks for the transition then. Um, for my first part, we're gonna kind of talk about stroke information. So if we could post the, um, actually post the stroke questions that we had prepped for this section, please. And we'll just take a moment uh, to kind of go through those. Hopefully, there we, there we go, awesome. Uh, hopefully everyone kind of has access to these. Um, I'm gonna answer them because I honestly can't remember writing them, which is kind of funny. If in doubt, just go with C, right? Usually, that's what we do, yeah. right? Okay, I hope that other people can see them because again, oh, I have one answer. Oh, good, well. But, I mean, I know it takes a minute to read it all to think about the answer. Word. Oh, yeah. I don't even think I can answer. <laughs> Huh. I thought that was the name of a gym. Who wrote these questions? Not Chris. Chris is the king of dad jokes, right? <laughs> and yours are so much better, right? Yeah, I know. I'll give it another couple seconds if we can, Rihanna, just to kind of see and Yeah, absolutely. We've got yeah, no, fifty eight percent of people have voted no. Oh, that's good. So we're going. Awesome. Well, why don't uh, we move on then? So that's oh, good. 30. No, we got to 70. Ooh. Sorry. <laughs> <Very exciting. laughs> I'm glad you're excited. You go ahead. Five, four, three, <laughs> two, one. Okay. I'm going to end it. Sure. Okay. Okay. Um, so the first thing I wanted to kind of connect is the link between why we talk about heart attacks and strokes together. Um, have you ever really asked yourself the question, why is it called the Heart and Stroke Foundation? What's the link? When they're affecting two very different systems in our body. Um, the link is that the risk factors are the exact same. Uh, so things that put us at risk for having a heart attack actually equally put us at same risk for having a stroke. Uh, these are things like heart disease, high blood pressure, stress, genetic factors. Um, so we'll start with what is a stroke, or you might hear it referred to as a cerebral, cerebral vascular accident in a hospital. Uh, and this means that blood flow to part of your brain has suddenly been interrupted. Um, without blood, blood, these brain cells then start to die in a way that is similar to a heart attack, but now we're talking about the computer, not the pumper. So as mentioned before, and it, it was one of the questions there, um, before, um, even though, sorry, the risk factors for stroke mirror those of having a heart attack, they do say that 80% of all strokes could be prevented by healthy lifestyle choices and regular checkups by a physician. So I think the big takeaway there is going to be just be proactive with your own health. There are more than 62,000 uh, strokes in Canada per year, and of them, about 51.3% are men, and an estimated 48.7% of stroke victims are women. Um, strokes are responsible for 6% or roughly 1 in 20 deaths in Canada. Locally, the U of A hospital will see over 7,000 stroke patients a year. Uh, that's about 20 a day, roughly. Um, on average, a stroke will occur every 10 minutes in Canada. And of all strokes, 15% will result in death. 10% will have a complete recovery, uh, which leaves the remaining 75% of stroke victims actually living with varying degrees of permanent disabilities. Um, so again, um, let's kind of talk about then who's at risk for this. Uh, stroke risk 
obviously is going to largely increase the older we get. Uh, after age 55, it's going to start doubling every 10 years based on the statistics. But of that, it's important to note that one third of all people who are hospitalized for strokes are actually under the age of 65. Um, there are 6.7 strokes for every 100,000 people under the age of 19, and one in 4,000 babies will actually have a stroke in utero or in the first month of life. Um, and a, the connection here is that we all are going to have varying degrees um, of risk. So uh, again, um, strokes as they uniquely relate to women. Um, stroke will disproportionately affect women, um, even though the signs and symptoms are the same for strokes uh, in men and women. Um, there are some unique risk factors that only exist in women, um, and they're due to three unique stages in a woman's life. Um, men and women's bodies are obviously different and will process things differently, but strokes affect women quite differently. Um, typically, women are far more likely to die from a stroke um, and have far worse outcomes um, typically than men. Um, during pregnancy, uh, the risk of a stroke increases greatly. And then again, in during menopause, as a woman's body is adapting to new hormone levels, the risk of stroke is increasing greatly as well. And then lastly, elderly women are actually at the highest risk category of, of having stroke for any demographic. Uh, their strokes are the most severe, have the poorest outcomes, and are most likely to end their independence. Um, oral contraception and hormone replacement therapy greatly increase the risk for having a stroke. Um, and as Chris kind of tied in before, uh, because women live longer they're, than men, they're more likely um, and more at risk to develop certain heart conditions such as atrial fibrillation that are going to massively increase, increase um, stroke risk. So epidemiology, which is a field of medicine that actually studies patterns and causes of injury and illness in certain populations or demographs, it'll show us that Indigenous women are at a greater risk for a stroke and actually twice as likely to die from stroke due to the remote access of some of their communities. Um, they are more likely to have high blood pressure and diabetes, which are major risk factors. Um, it'll also show us that South Asian women are more likely to have type two diabetes and women of African descent are more likely to have high blood pressure and obesity. And those are all major contributing factors to having a stroke. Um, so very quickly, uh, I want to start talking about the different types of stroke and bear with me as I again figure out how to share my is this ah um huh I uh I don't really okay hang on a Mike, what is that um I actually you know what now it's out of the bag um you need to start answering your text I think I was obviously processing something this day and I was trying to do it in a very creative way. Um, I honestly don't know how this made it in here. Mike, learn to knit. Sorry, I'm pretty embarrassed. Uh, there, okay, here we go. Um, back on track, sorry about that, Chris. Um, so our first type of stroke we're actually gonna talk about is something called a transient ischemic attack. They're at the top. Um, also, you hear it referred to as a TIA for short or a mini or a warning stroke. Um, this is a, a sudden but temporary blockage of blood flow in the brain. Um, the clot or the symptoms are only going to last a short amount of time. But why they call it a warning stroke is typically people that um, have a TIA will actually go on to have their full stroke within one year. Um, right now, some groundbreaking research is being done into the area of TIA in that more women uh, than men are presenting signs and symptoms of a TIA, but are actually having a true full stroke, and it's actually not found during imaging. Um, moving forward then that second type, um, and I have it starred because it accounts for 87% of all strokes, uh, and that's an ischemic stroke. So this occurs when a blood clot stops blood flow in part of our brain. Um, the clot is usually due to the deposition of plaques or atherosclerosis. Atherosclero ather Chris, I need help with a word. Mike, it's okay, buddy. I got you. Sound it out, remember? Atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis. There you go. I knew That's you could do it. Okay. You got it. Thanks. You're doing uh, great. Deposition of plaques or atherosclerosis in cardiovascular disease. Um, and the third, 
Yeah, thanks. Third and final type is going to be what we call a hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, this is more commonly known as an aneurysm. And this is when we have a portion of a weakened artery in our brain, so a vessel in our brain, that actually ruptures, causing free bleeding into the brain. Um, some extreme rises in blood pressure can actually cause this, but they typically have very poor survival outcomes. Um, so and if I can just, again, bear with me. There's not another picture of me, is there? No, I actually am just going to stop. So there we go. Perfect. I think uh, my picture was still better than this view, though. Okay, you can stop talking. You had your half hour. <laughs> so uh, moving forward, though, um, the big key here is actually going to be recognition. It's as important as, you know, Chris was talking about with heart attack. There are some aggressive forms of medication called TP TPA. Uh, and if they're given in the first 90 minutes of the onset of an ischemic stroke, there is a 30% increase that a complete recovery can be made with no deficits. Uh, so when dealing with an event that we talked about only actually has a 10% rate of a full recovery, the aspect of increasing that by 30% through early intervention is huge. So just think to yourself that better recognition will lead to better interventions, which will lead to better outcomes. Um, so then what is, what is a stroke going to look like? Uh, and we talk about those typical, and I think kind of universally, um, kind of universally understood stroke signs. So we'll look at the first one is going to be that facial droop. Um, and that's where we see paralysis to one side of the face. The second uh, most common one we'll see is then that paralysis to one side of the body, like an arm and the leg. Uh, have lost the ability to move. And then lastly, some, a degree of speech impairment. And those kind of three are the basics for a lot of you know, first aid interventions in terms of recognition. But just like with heart attack, there's a whole other kind of secondary red list with stroke of more atypical or more subtle, often missed signs. Uh, so we'll kind of just dive into some of those. 65% of stroke victims will actually lose the ability to swallow. Um, aspiration and choking are a major concern for stroke survivors. Um, often the drooling we see associated with strokes, uh, you know, people kind of thought it was had to do something with the facial droop. More likely it has to do with the person's loss, the ability to swallow. Um, a sudden loss of vision in one or both eyes is uh, we can often, well, less often we'll see. Um, and, another, and another important one too is a sudden loss of balance or coordination. And this can often be mistaken for drunkenness. Um, unfortunately, this happens at times in inner city populations um, where the victim ends up kind of thrown in the drunk tank and then later dies from stroke or even low sugars in a diabetic event. Um, I'm not bringing this up to assign blame towards an unbiased, or excuse me, unconscious bias issue. Um, but more, I'm just trying to highlight how there's a gap here that can be filled with some education, um, just, just like we're trying to do tonight with our little FaceTime meeting. Um, back to our list, a sudden severe headache without cause can be a sign of a stroke. This is often mistaken as a migraine in conjunction with the balance or vision impairment. Um, just remember that this isn't a, a headache that it started subtle and through the day progressed to be a, a terrible, you know, drill in your head. This is one that didn't exist. And then suddenly out of nowhere, it's the worst headache you've ever had. Um, a sudden onset of major fatigue or lethargy, which again, that mirrors some of those atypical signs of a heart attack. Sudden loss of sensation, like a, a, a victim might lose the ability to smell, feel, or touch. Um, and then sometimes sudden speech problems without cause, um, where we might see not just slurring, but inappropriate words, and often again can be mistaken from drunkenness. So all of these things can then appear in conjunction with typical signs and symptoms of a stroke, but also they can show up on their own by themselves in some extreme cases. So if I talked about recognition being so important, um, I have yet another slide that I hope I don't mess up, but uh, I'm just gonna introduce a small tool that we use at the first aid level, um, there we go. Hey, I got the right one. Um, which we kind of use this uh, for basic stroke recognition at a first aid level, as I was saying. So we call this the FAST exam, and it's like one of 10,000 acronyms that they seem to use in the medical field, but this one's pretty basic. So if you're looking at a person and you want to confirm the stroke, then 
We're looking at the F, we look at the face, is it drooping? We look at the arms, the A is for arms, are they moving? And speech, S, is the speech slurring? And if so, T is time to call 911 because that early recognition is everything. Uh, Chris, do you want to maybe make your way in here and I'll just dim that boy. A very I'm quick fine. version, thanks buddy. I'll uh, pause here one second. So, where are you? I'm, I'm here. I'm here. I just took out your wall. Oh, well, uh, I guess the secret's out. The budget of Med Talks, the, the head office is in a furnace room. <laughs> so, anyway, thanks for uh, bursting that bubble. Yeah, you bet. Wish we all had St. Albert income. Okay, so. Um, hey, can you move over? Yeah, sorry. They buddy. probably want me in the picture. Probably. Room. There we go. Hey, good to see you. Hey. So we'll just demo a very quick fast exam. Um, again, starting on that, that gap, the first thing I'm gonna assess is Chris's face. It's not always as obvious as this big paralyzed size of a face. So I'll usually ask my patient, can you show me your teeth? Can you smile for me? And we'll see this, you know, suddenly he has a fairly contorted smile. Uh, the next thing I'm gonna assess is that arm movement. I can do things like telling my patient, sir, can you close your eyes for me? I'm going to hold your arms out straight in front of you, and what I want you to do is hold them out when I let go. And at this point, usually, and I'm sure it's hard to see on the small camera, but one arm, one arm will drop. Another way we can test that would be simply putting your fingers in the person's hands and asking them to squeeze as hard as they can. And maybe one side, Chris, has a death grip. I'd kind of compare it to my eight-year-old's grip. And on the other side, it's pretty limp okay so we've assessed that uh, the other thing we'll do is assessing the speech and it's not just for kind of more motor function of speech but uh, possibly the insertion of inappropriate words so I'll use just to ask a patient or a victim to repeat something simple after me sir uh, can you repeat after me Monday Tuesday Wednesday Thursday Friday Monday Tuesday Wednesday Thursday Friday perfect and that was actually an Oscar worthy performance um so Using that tool then, uh, obviously I would say this is now time to call 911 and I would kind of make note of the last time I saw Chris normal, if I could, to try to protect that window of early access for some of the interventions. When have you seen me normal? Never, you're excused. No, no. okay, thanks. See you, everybody. Get out of my closet. So, um, so that kind of brings us to the end now then of our, you know, the stroke portion, if we could, why don't we post uh, kind of the poll results from our stroke knowledge test at the beginning, please, Rhiannon, or Crystal, whoever's in charge of it? I will do that. I also, um, okay, good. I had muted Chris because there was a yeah. bit. I Did Mike tell you to do that? <laughs> I texted her. <laughs> All right, I'm sharing the results now. So yeah, just quickly reviewing them again. So um, yeah, uh, obviously, in the end, a, a very large portion of strokes could be avoided if we were proactive, and that was that 80%. Um, looking at further here, um, yeah, about one in 20, so that's 6%. Good job. This is the dark, that was kind of a dark question, I agree. Um, we'll be left with 75% so yeah, then of those victims uh, end up with some sort of deficit. And then, yes, Pinoca, believe it or not, is home of the Centennial Center, which is kind of a world-class traumatic brain injury rehab facility. Um, you need to get in there pretty quick though, since it is so sought after. And yeah, it's also the name of a gym, I think in Fort Saskatchewan. So uh, wonderful work. Um, if we wanna kind of remove those, um, why don't uh, we open up to a couple questions if there were any? There were some in the chat box. Sure. So the first one said, can you speak to how S TV relates to cardiac arrest or stroke? Sure, Chris, um, do you want to take that one as it's a, a heart rhythm a little bit more and you're talking about, um, you know, we're talking about that heart disease then a little bit more? Uh, are we talking about like stroke volume? Or are you talking about SVT as in like, um, you know, supraventricular tachycardia, stuff like that, things of that sort. I think, I'm just sorry, there's just 10,000 different acronyms that <laughs> trying to sort through which one that was. Uh, you might use uh, Yeah, it's the supraventricular um, tachycardia. Sure. Does that increase your risk for either stroke or cardiac arrest? 
Uh, it very much so. On top. So when we actually look at something where, say, the ventricles are then affected, that something of that over time um, will, the, your left ventricle, so the chamber of your heart that is pushing blood out to your body, if it's having to work harder, that can then start to get some muscle stiffness and we'll start to see the development of that uh, cardiovascular disease, congestive heart failure, uh, things like that, which are then all going to massively increase our, our risk for, say, a stroke or for a heart attack. So I hope that, was that a clear enough answer for what you were looking for? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Perfect. Okay. Any others? There was another question. Um, if on track to have a big one within one year of a transient ischemic attack, yeah. what's the best way to prevent this? You know, uh, and that's, again, that's a, that's a very good question too. And quite often we'll actually encounter patients that say they go in for, you know, a TA on a Tuesday morning and they're clear of imaging and they're actually back home Tuesday night. And then on the Thursday of the same week, they have a full blown stroke. Uh, sometimes we'll see people that go on to, you know, two years to five years, which would be extreme that they could actually kind of, um, you know, get through. But it all depends on a lot of different factors that are then, you know, you can have cerebral vascular disease. So you have plaque buildup in your brain, which we can't necessarily reverse at this point too well. Uh, same with some of those major cardiovascular disease, those, those fatty deposits in the lining of our arteries. Um, that being said, though, you can, through some very healthy lifestyle choices, you can really prolong and kind of stave that off. Uh, it's just the underlying condition is something that we can't really deal with. So a lot of those interventions at that point are aimed at sort of you know, redefining what your life might be about so we can actually get sort of your, your best existence, if that makes sense. Okay, I think that was good. Um, yeah, I did see one that actually popped up about um, HS has a stroke unit. So um, there, there was a, a piece, uh, and, and Mike, I don't know if you kind of like touched on that, but uh, HS does have a stroke unit or a stroke ambulance. Uh, it's based out of the U of A hospital. As Mike said, that's kind of the main hub in Alberta for strokes. Um, the purpose of that unit isn't necessarily going to be for intercity. It's going to be that if we're in a rural area, if there is an ambulance unit that has recognized that the person is possibly having a stroke, um, they will basically send that unit one way and they'll have the ambulance driving the other way and they'll kind of meet in the middle. Um, that ambulance has... Um, connections uh, by like uh, like a Skype video and audio uh, directly to uh, the doctors at the U of A. Uh, it also has like a MRI head scan machine built right into the ambulance so that they can tell what type of bleed or what type of uh, clot that it is and where that is in the brain, so. Awesome. Um, I just kind of did a little time check and I guess we should probably get rolling here because as much as Chris and I want to be here all night, I'm sure other people would argue with us. So um, if we want to... Sorry, there's just one other question sure. on this topic. Is that okay? Yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, it's up to you. Up to you so. And I get to say the word now. Can a theory... See, you messed me up. I know. <laughs> Call Chris on this one. Atherosclerosis. Ather yeah. ath Atherosclerosis. Can atherosclerosis be diagnosed in someone with risk factors, but no events requiring testing that would be involved with an event? So I'm... I think uh, very much so heart disease can actually be diagnosed outside of having, say, a heart attack or uh, angina or any of those type typical things. They, there are a lot of different tests they can actually do from you know, blood tests to see presence of certain uh, hormones um, or chemicals. There are different ways they can image your heart and actually see how progressed uh, blockages can be ahead of time. So that's very much why regular um, visits with, you know, a generalist are important because um, they can kind of recognize maybe some of the, the, the subtle things that with, say, your vital signs or some of your sleep cycles or a lot of different factors that maybe haven't dawned on you that something could be wrong. So uh, very much so a, you know, just regular checkups with the doctor are very important. Okay, thank you. 
Um, I think that you wanted me to launch the next polling question. You know what, as much as I could, yeah. And again, if there is, you know, more questions, I'd love to circle back to them at the end. I just want to make sure we do have time to get through what we kind of had set out. So. Yeah, for sure. And I don't, there weren't any in the chat box. So here we go, launching the next poll. Awesome. So yeah, these are, these are going to kind of uh, segue now into our, our stress manifestation part of the talk. Um, so if you want to just take a minute to kind of look at some of these questions and see how you fare. Oh, I'm nailing these, Mike. Are you? Yeah. There must be a delay because I still have, there's nothing. There must be a delay. I have them, so. Yeah, I have them as well. So. I wrote you exempt from them, though. Okay. Yeah, answers are starting to come in. Oh, good. Well, I know the answer to this one. I hope you answered it right, but. These are some legit questions, and I'd be interested to see how people would actually, now that they've seen us talk a while, and I think they'll be on Team Mike with that one. Where is that one? I'm just impressed with, well, you'll see the answer. <laughs> Sorry, now I see them. Hey, there it is. Okay, we have about 54% of the vote, 60, we're up to 60. I'll give it like 10 more seconds. I have a little thing popping up. Okay. Melanie thinks you guys are hilarious. Thank you. Which you are. You. All right. Okay, so five, four, three, two, one. I feel like I'm talking to my kids. Yay. Okay, <laughs> okay. boiling is ended. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so yeah, to, to kind of segue into this then, in talking about stress and stress manifestations, um, according to the World Health um, Organization, stress is the cause of at least 60% of all human disease and illness. Um, it's now understood that stress as a lone factor can increase your risk of developing heart disease by 40%, uh, of having a heart attack by 25%, and of having a stroke by 50%. So basically what I'm trying to say is that stress is the number one proxy killer on the planet, but it's very rarely ever thought as the culprit. Um, your body's very cleverly designed, uh, but it's also pretty slow to evolve. Um, we have some built-in survival responses that were pretty great back when being eaten by a predator or attacked by a neighboring tribe was commonplace. Um, the physiological responses are designed so we can act quickly when in danger and are intended to keep us out of physical harm's way. Um, my visual to go with this. So when we then, when a threat is perceived, um, excuse me, uh, when a threat is perceived, that age old fight or flight mechanism is going to kick in, which is great if I'm being hunted so I can defend myself or hightail it out of there. Um, fight or flight now is actually more ref often referred to as the stress response. Um, these days, however, threats are perceived very differently and at an emotional level, both the body reacts in the exact same ways to these stressors. Um, and repetitive fight or flight responses cause some pretty big unwanted wear and tear on our body. Um, did anyone know, and unfortunately for our health, that uh, our body will actually have the exact same physiological response to running late for an appointment and stressing about it as we would having to fight a shark with a laser on its head. Um, my next slide. So perceived uh, threats or stress can come in any form today, but are more likely to be involved with work, family, finances, relationships, or even COVID, say, than they are to be about tribal warfare or attacks from large predators that uh, want to feed you to their young. Um, essentially, stressors have evolved, but our stress management system hasn't in a lot of ways. And this is how I was trying to be so clever and highlight that point. Um, just moving forward, I need to set up a couple of things here. I apologize. Um, so I did a little exercise with myself then um, for tonight, and it's sort of to highlight this point. And I made two lists. Um, the first one being what I figured my stressors would have been at the emergence of this version of our species. And then um, the second list was looking at a few seconds worth of my flowing consciousness here in 2020 as myself. So I'm going to kind of, so kind of side by side these shortly, and we'll just kind of 
you get an idea. So this is what I figured my stress would have been uh, 200,000 years ago. Uh, and again, they're very based on kind of moment to moment survival. I figured I need to make a fire, I need to make a spear. Uh, I don't want to get eaten. I need to find a cave. Don't look directly at the sun. It's bad for you. And I need to hunt cute little rabbits. Um, the other side of this though, when I kind of side by sided it, this was an excerpt of my stress journal. It's page 47 of 390 uh, from about five minutes in the month of March, which you remember was the onset of COVID. Um, so if we're looking at it, you know, school was canceled on a Sunday evening and Monday morning I was a grade two teacher. Um, coffee filters became my new toilet paper. I don't know if everyone remembers that the outbreak of this pandemic, for some reason everyone panicked, was thinking with their butts for some reason, and you couldn't find toilet paper anywhere. Um, things like worrying about am I going to get sick? If I get sick, who's going to parent? What if my parents get sick? What do I tell my daughter? Everyone seems to have gone crazy. The gyms are closed. Gym equipment for home is super expensive. I can't seem to go outside apparently now. Uh, looking in the mirror is my hair thinning from stress. Who's going to cut my hair now? What if I get laid off? I don't have enough money saved up. The grocery seems to be out of everything and there's crazy lineups. Am I going to have to eat my neighbors when all the food runs out? I haven't slept in days. The oil economy in Alberta seemed to be dropping before this even happened. And the other big one is I really haven't seen Chris in a really long time either. Um, oh, buddy. Hey, I know. It was, it was March sucked. You know what I mean? Um, so just kind of setting up then, uh, and back to kind of then um, where I was going with stress, sorry. I, sometimes I get so sidetracked because I think I'm funny. Um, big or small, the size of the threat isn't necessarily what's important. It's the fact that it might be repetitive or a constant state of stress. So fight or flight is actually happening on a scale that we might not be mentally aware of. Um, very, very quickly, uh, I want to introduce something that is called the general adaptation syndrome or gas for short. Um, this is more simply called the stress cycle and it refers to uh, the physical stages that our body is going to go through while processing stress. Uh, the first, and I think it's kind of everyone is familiar with it, it's called the alarm stage. And this stage is recognized as fight or flight response. Um, we're going to look at it a lot more in depth in a moment here, but essentially it just involves a large hormone release that's aimed at making me stronger, faster, and more focused so I can deal with the immediate threat. I think it's really important to interject, though, that this entire process is de designed to be reset, uh, where it actually has a very big conclusion phase where our body can then start to return to homeostasis on a chemical level and by design that should actually happen after fight or flight or after I'm out of that immediate danger. Um, the second stage of this response though if it is continued, <clears throat> excuse me, it's called the resistance stage and this is like a bonus round where our body is actually going to resist the urge to reset uh, and that way it can continue these crisis level hormones so we can stay in the battle. Um, in this stage, our body though starts to shuffle around energy um, to maintain higher energy demands, which are needed for the situation. And we'll start to dip way deeper into the resources that are available to our systems. Um, lastly, the third and final stage of this process is called the exhaustion phase. Um, and this is where our body has depleted all of its resources and our systems not essential to survival can actually be shut down. Um, this is obviously the stage that we want to avoid if at all possible. Uh, and hopefully we can hit that recovery phase much sooner as the potential for mental illness taking hold is pretty major during this phase. Um, so just to kind of recap that with a visual. Um, so that general adaptation syndrome, um, so that was a really quick and dirty explanation um, of the stress cycle um, or general adaptation syndrome. Um, it's aimed at having you think about while your brain is dealing with the, the daily stressors, what actually is going on inside your body at the same time. Um, the other reason why is now that you know the GAS acronym, the next time you're super stressed out and someone asks you what's wrong, you can simply just say you've got GAS. But boom. Chris, that was my contrib contribution to dad jokes for the night. It was okay. You did okay. It was okay. I killed. I even drew a cartoon. <laughs> and you did a drum roll. I did a drum roll. Come on. Um, Shannon's biased, by the way. Yeah, anyway. <laughs>
So uh, back on, so let's start to break this down a little bit more into its parts so we can see how over time chronic stress can really make us sick. Um, when stress or a threat is perceived, our brain is gonna trigger that air raid siren, that alarm state, right? And that's signaling our adrenal glands, which are on top of your kidneys, to do their thing. And their thing is releasing hormones that are designed to help us survive an encounter. Uh, the first hormone we're gonna look at is then adrenaline, and it does some pretty brilliant things. First thing that adrenaline is gonna do is make my heart beat faster so I can move more blood around to my muscles and organs, which I'm gonna need for battle or for flight. Uh, but right now when I'm sitting here stressing about whether or not this presentation is going well or not, um, maybe not the most useful thing in this setting, right? The next thing that's actually gonna, adrenaline is gonna affect is, it's gonna make my blood pressure go up. This happens by making all of my blood vessels, so my arteries and veins, const to constrict. Uh, and that makes it so blood actually doesn't have to travel as far to get to my muscles and my organs. Super useful while I'm in meeting at work talking to coworkers, right? Um, lastly, um, it's gonna make a energy available to me to increase. Uh, this is good because I might have to run a really long time to get away from this pack of hungry wolves. But in reality, I'm on the phone with the phone company trying to teach them how to do their job after they overcharge me my phone bill for the third, third time in a row. Um, the other big hormone then we're gonna look at is cortisol. Uh, and this is the one we wanna pay attention to because it is the primary stress hormone. And it does some amazing things. Um, the first thing that cortisol is actually gonna do is it's going to increase the glucose or sugars that are circulating in my blood. Um, glucose is the main energy source for all living organisms. So this is like hitting the afterburners on a rocket in a sense. I have more fuel. Um, the other positive of cortisol, it actually improves my brain's usage of, of glucose uh, or sugars, which is essentially focusing me. Um, this is rad if I'm, say, you know, having to finish some assignment that is two days late and I'm behind the ball and I have to kind of cram, 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 right? I have the ability to, to excuse me, to focus. Um, Cortisol though, so we're gonna say it's useful in a lot of senses, but it does cause some wear and tear on the system. The, and the negatives, um, you know, maybe in the setting of chronic stress are gonna far outweigh the benefits. In a run for your life setting, let's say that, you know, cortisol is gonna be pretty useful. But again, if it's triggered by a workplace stressor, um, let's explore a little bit why that's gonna be bad. So cortisol actually will impede or block the other systems that aren't deemed necessary to do battle. They don't, it doesn't want you wasting energy on things that aren't necessary right now. So some of those systems that will be impeded, firstly is gonna be my digestion. Um, I don't need to be digesting while I'm dodging a hail of arrows, but in the setting of chronic stress, uh, the result is obviously gonna be appetite fluctuations, digestive issues like diarrhea, uh, I call them the stress dumps, I mean, why not? Weight loss, weight gain, binge eating uh, or stress eating. Another big thing that's going to happen is immune function. Um, I don't need white blood cells right now to be fighting a war. I need weapons. Uh, but now in the setting of chronic stress, my immune function is going to be suppressed. So I can start to get things like bacteria or viral infections constantly. Uh, colds and flus are going to last a lot longer. Simple infections might turn into something serious like pneumonia, but it just started with a cold. Um, stress can also trick our immune systems into attacking your healthy cells uh, as it's basically just overwhelmed and doesn't really recognize friend from foe in some cases. Another big system affected is going to be my reproductive system. I don't need energy to be making babies right now when I'm in danger. So in the setting of chronic stress, uh, that can lead to reduced or non-existent sex drive, uh, erectile dysfunction, fertility issues, um, the bedroom Olympics literally might only happen once every four years. Um, another big system then that's going to be affected are my growth functions. I don't need to be growing right now um, other than say tissue repair, but in the chronic stress setting then we start to see things like hair loss, loss of muscle mass, and injuries are very slow to, to heal. Um, last one I'll talk about and it's arguably you know one of the the most important ones is the effect it's going to have on my sleep, uh, sleep cycles or the systems responsible for regulating sleep. Ask yourself, have you ever wondered why it's so hard to sleep on the eve of a big presentation or event? 
uh, are in the midst of a fight with your spouse or partner, waiting to hear back on a contract bid after days and days. Well, again, this whole process, the effect is the culprit. Um, my body sees a threat that needs to be fought off, so I need the opposite of sleep for fight or flight. But sleep is one of the, the most important basic functions we need as humans to thrive. So these are just some of the physical effects that chronic stress can have on our body. Um, maybe now everyone can just appreciate how cruel my scare joke was on Chris earlier. Um, the other side of it though is going to be the, the mental health side. Um, I, I don't really want to talk too much about it because I don't want to steal anything from Chris's side that he's going to talk about next. But I will say simply that the impact, uh, the mental impact of chronic stress is enormous. Obviously, when we're looking through the lens, um, the risk of depression, anxiety, suicide risk is going to be far greater in that exhaustion phase of that process where our body is just simply wanting to give up because it's so depleted. Um, kind of just in closing with it all then, um, my last sort of visual with it. So what are the answers? Um, I don't really have the answers and personally I don't know if necessarily there are some just general ones that are going to fit everybody. Um, the answers are only going to come from you and learning how to navigate and positively cope with your unique stress because nobody can feel like you do. Um, I, you know, I, I, I think it's universally understood that two people could uh, be present for the same event and experience it entirely different. Um, sort of like the special theory of relativity for physics nerds, right? I can tell a person I know what they're going through, but I really don't know what it's like, uh, what it's like for them. I only know what it's like for me to have gone through it. Um, so I think universally it's important for us to practice active listening and use our ears sometimes more than our mouths when we're, you know, talking with loved ones that might be facing a really hard time. Um, I always encourage the obvious things like exercise, eat better, drink a lot of water, talk to people, enjoy your loved ones, don't let work take away from the things that are around you. Basically just keep giving your body the things that it actually needs, the resources it needs, so it's not so easily depleted. Um, my goal here was more just to kind of paint a picture for everyone to understand that stress can make you sick. Uh, it can cause fatal things to happen, like a heart attack or a stroke much earlier in your life. Um, and in making that connection, I just hope that you maybe can become more self-aware um, of how you're feeling or maybe make a few lifestyle choices that will positively affect your outcome. Um, don't yell at each other. Um, we're all under some degree of stress right now as a species. We're all tied to one another in this pandemic, whether we like it or not. So let's all be more mindful of things that we can control and of the things that we can't control. Um, you know, take care of one another in your work, in your home, uh, and your family. Don't sweat the small stuff because in the end, it's just not worth it. Uh, the stress is more likely to kill you than the stressor itself. Um, so I think at this point then, I will kind of ask Brianne if she could to um, put up, thank you, the results from our no. Earlier, there we go. Yep, up they come. Perfect. Uh, and just so looking at stress, um, wow, yeah. So yeah, sixty percent is. I mean, again, that was a um, you know, a big number. Primary we're stress, really good. Yep. Yeah, cortisol. Everyone knew that one. Awesome. Uh, loan factor again. Yep. Um, risk of heart disease, forty percent. And uh, oh, interesting. <laughs> Mike is to blame. 30, 30. We're almost split down the middle. I don't know I would get it with my crafty drawing about how literally Chris will answer my text four days later and I've already moved on in life. Um, good. Uh, so then I just want to open it up to is there any questions that, you know, again, I'm not a mental health specialist by any mean, but I have a fairly good um, understanding of just how some of you know the physiological responses are connected to your general health so if there's any questions about stress um you know I'd, I'd love to take them the best i can i haven't seen any questions about stress there is a big thank you from courtney um that she spoke to you about some chest pain last year oh and she said remember that she has coronary artery Spasm, one of the big triggers is stress. There you go. Um, oh my goodness. So stress 
That's awesome. Stress, uh, right? What a terrible year. It's the worst. It is the worst. Um, well, uh, yeah, if there's no questions, I'm going to take that as I pretty much knocked that one out of the park. <laughs> so you're welcome. Um, but why don't we then, uh, again, move on to uh, Chris, and you can kind of close things out with a little bit of mental health stuff. Okay. Do you want me to do the last poll? Yeah, I want to do the yeah. last poll, and Chris, you can take us home, please. Yeah, let's do this one last time and see how everybody does. We got 75% answering last time. I was very excited about that. Nice. That's good. Yeah. Good. Everybody's still here and engaged. They haven't fallen asleep. That's good. Let's see if I can answer my own questions. <clears throat> I'm curious when you do talk about this, if if you think that maybe the numbers are underreported just because people don't necessarily report. That's that. Sixty-eight, and we are so much faster now. <laughs> Raise again. We we should have had like a, a little test quiz at the start just to see how it. Eighty percent in less than a minute. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why it's so exciting. <laughs> There's only three questions this time. <laughs> oh well, that's why. Okay, yeah, forty-three Perfect. people there. Okay, so three, two, one. Okay. Perfect. Oh, I think we got an extra person. Okay, great. Awesome. It's perfect. Okay. Okay. Um, so yeah, we'll, uh, we'll bring this home. So mental health. So I actually, I put a bit of time into this one. It's uh, uh, mental health is definitely a, a huge and important topic right now. Although the more and more I read and the more and more I, I talked to um, a little bit more subject matter experts on it, I, I, I still decided in the end, keep it pretty simple. Um, um, so doing some research, um, I found that the info and the, um, the messages in most literature and I, is, is fairly similar. And I think I, I found that with the Canadian Mental Health Association that states it best. I'm just going to kind of read this part here so I get it right. Um, mental illness indirectly affects all Canadians of all ages, education, uh, income levels or cultures at some point in their lives. Uh, it goes on to say that this can be through a family member, a friend, a colleague, or it can be themselves. I found it interesting when I was reading some of this that um, the language that's used, it, it's still, to me, when I read that statement, it's like this is a message that, that the mental illness is happening to someone else. Uh, as the reader, even though they use the words themselves, it makes me think that it can happen to them and not necessarily to me. Um, statistics, though, on the other hand, show, show otherwise. So in Canada, by age 40, approximately 50% of Canadians will have or have had a mental illness. Um, in any given year, one in five can, uh, people in Canada will personally experience mental illness uh, uh, as a health problem or, or illness. Um, anxiety disorders uh, affect 5% of the household which can cause or lead to mild or severe impairment within the home. 8% uh, of adults will experience major depression at some point in their lives. 11.6% of Canadians 18 years or older suffer from mood or anxiety disorder. Suicide, uh, the big, big topic we down there is one of the leading causes of death in men and women. Um, from adolescence to middle age and accounts for 24% of de all deaths from ages 15 to 24. 15 is pretty, pretty young. Um, and the list goes on and on. Not to mention if we're talking about age demographics, um, that's estimated that 80 to 90% of all seniors in Canada have some form of mental, mental disorder. Now, you may think that, yeah, Chris, that makes sense. So like you look at dementia, you look at Alzheimer's, um, the cause or the loss of nerve cells, um, the damage to those, those pathway functions or nerve functions that trigger a decline in thinking skills, um, cognitive behavior. But in fact, depression, although it could be linked to some medical condition, depression accounts for more than 50% of mental illness in the elderly. So that's a pretty huge number there, I feel. Um, so all these stats are just saying that it's not just 
them. It's, it's you. It's me that can be affected. It truly does affect everybody. So I'm just going to bring up one other thing here. That is. Okay. Um, so what are the main factors that contribute to mental illness or, or these conditions? And Mike kind of touched on, on a few of them there as well. Um, we call these kind of like destabilizing factors. There's some of the big life events, if you will, that can kind of contribute or kind of start that process of that mental illness or that mental crisis. Um, family history is definitely in there. Um, just showing the link of genetics and, and how that is related. Um, childhood trauma as well uh, can definitely affect. So there's some of those conditions that are just really uncontrolled or out of our hands. Um, substance abuse is obviously an increase. Uh, dysfunctional family. So when we talk about that, there's so many different things when you go down the rabbit hole of what makes um, the term of a, a dysfunctional family or dysfunctional home. Uh, it can be anything, the really big ones and serious ones of, of abuse. Uh, can be something as simple as poor communication between everybody in the home. Um, it can be really affected by if somebody in the house is a, a perfectionist or is a little over controlling. Um, as you go down further and further, there are different families that having a, a child with special needs or multiple children can kind of trigger those. And Mike, you and I are kind of on that, that rope there too. We're not looking too great because uh, shift work is on that list down at the bottom somewhere as well of, of stressors or things that can kind of cause that dysfunctional family and that, that stress within the home. Um, the other really big life changes or those life events are definitely divorce, um, a loss of a job or even a change of the job. Um, for kids, uh, changing of schools, changing of a group of friends is, is huge for them in their life and in their world and in their bubble. Um, and then, of course, the loss or death of a love. Um, now, when we look at these factors in relation to COVID, uh, how many of these do we see right now? They, they talk about the, the divorce rates going to be going up and everybody sitting at home and together and pretty much getting on, <laughs> on each other's nerves. Um, job loss is, is huge. Unemployment is huge right now. Uh, the change of school for kids, maybe not necessarily a change in school, but you know, you're going from, you know, your grade two, grade three class, and all of a sudden Mike is your grade two teacher the next day, right? Monday morning, like that's a pretty big change of school right there. Um, all the kids, uh, uh, we've definitely even seen that in our home with our little guy going to, to kindergarten to grade one, and those are, those are big changes. <clears throat> so, um, the scariest part to all these stats and statistics and, and going into COVID is that uh, with everything that we've researched and uh, I've talked to different members on our MedTalks team, um, that none of these stats and facts really capture what is going on right now. They haven't updated these. They haven't seen what true effect this is going to have on everybody and kind of in a long term with COVID-19. Um, COVID-19 is the pandemic is a stress. Uh, the fear and anxiety from that situation can be overwhelming and can be can cause strong emotions in in children and in adults um, that stress can not only contribute to worsening chronic health conditions um, but uh, to the mental health conditions that people may already have or underlying conditions they might not know about yet um, that can also cause uh, a coping or compromising your coping mechanisms such as like Mike was saying the lack of sleep uh, poor eating habits uh, not to mention in decrease in your social connections and the loss of support services that are actually in place and, and unfortunately have to get closed down for that period of time uh, I think both Mike and I um, as members of the Edmonton Fire Rescue Service uh, we can say that these effects are definitely showing in our calls and in our communities uh, I unfortunately, I can't provide any hard numbers or hard statistics on um, the exact increase, but um, pandemic calls obviously are there. Um, Mike and I are both at a station in Northside Edmonton, which is one of the largest areas for the increase in, in COVID uh, cases right now. Uh, so we're definitely seeing a lot of those. Uh, welfare calls are, are still a, 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 unfortunately, a factor in our job and uh, 
to be going and checking in on everybody. Um, difficulty breathing, even just from simple anxiety attacks is, is up. Um, people calling 911 over and over for those, they just don't know how to handle all those stressors. Uh, a huge, huge, huge increase in opiate overdose. And this one I actually, I do have numbers on. Um, the provincial government has shown that there is an increase or the numbers have doubled in opiate overdose deaths. Um, from April, April to June, they total 301 deaths, which is twice as many from January to March. Um, now, opiate overdose deaths are a high number, but that doesn't even account for all the overdose calls that we go to that we, we are able to bring the people back, whether it's, it's us, AHS, uh, getting into, them, in, into the hospital. Uh, drug use, uh, overdose, uh, alcohol increase. I hate to say it, but like how many people like are, are sitting at home and say, like, well, what else am I going to do? Well, let's crack another beer. Let's, let's have a driveway beer because that's the only social interaction that we can even have right now. Um, chronic health conditions, everybody with uh, breathing emergencies like COPD, um, heart conditions, CHF, uh, even conditions like diabetes. Um, stress is a huge factor on them. We've, we've, we've talked about that. Um, it's a huge influence on those conditions. And the fact is, is we find that more and more people are putting off going to the hospital, putting off going to their regular appointments because they, they're afraid to go into the, that hospital setting and that hospital system because of COVID. So they push it and they wait till it's, it's really tough on their system. And then they're, they're not doing very well at all. Um, so as first responders with EFRS, uh, we're trained in mental health uh, first aid, and we use um, the mental health continuum model to assist the citizens of Edmonton and to watch out for our brothers and sisters with Edmonton Fire. I'll just show you, Sorry, bear with me here. Okay. Um, so just like physical first aid that we provide, uh, we use mental health first aid uh, when supporting someone during a mental health crisis. Um, when we respond to a 911 call, we see a lot of people at the worst, worst moments in the worst day of their lives, uh, whether that is physical or a mental condition. Uh, we step into their lives, we enter into that door and um, into their world and have to figure out how to recognize the crisis and how to engage them in that moment when maybe they're really not capable of doing so. Um, it's, it's a pretty tough process for, for them and us. Um, we use the mental health continuum. It's, it's broken down into a pretty simple structure, uh, as everybody can see there. I will say before I flip off of this, um, if anybody does want to take a chance of taking a screenshot of this or looking this up afterwards, definitely um, capitalize on that opportunity. Um, so as you can see, just kind of broken up into the, the four sections there, green being the healthiest and uh, red being uh, the most uh, kind of struggle for the mental health continuum. Um, just uh, kind of walking through some of those signs, like obviously the green is pretty straightforward, um, physically, socially active, uh, performing well, normal sleep, normal, normal health. Uh, they're able to process things. They're able to process stresses uh, easily, uh, quickly, and manage those after they break them into the smaller tasks. Um, as we move into the yellow, um, I think that we've all been here where we're a little bit irritable, we're a little bit impatient, a little distracted. Sleeping becomes a little bit tougher for us. We have some lower energy. I'm probably functioning in this zone quite a bit with shift work and three kids and all the things going on, um, you know, but uh, thankfully I have a strong support system at home as well that brings me back to the green. Um, as we get into that orange and into the, the injured, um, I think this is where we really start to notice that, you know, hey, did you notice Bob at the office today? Man, is he, is he really like, he's really grumpy today and man, he's really snapping at everybody. Um, just a negative attitude, their, their work function or their, their professionalism is kind of lacking in the sense that they are arriving late, they're not getting tasks completed, uh, not pulling their weight, if you will, around the office or on that job site. Um, 
at this stage especially, they need to prioritize some self-care for themselves. Uh, you don't want to continue and to keep going down the path that you are and get into that kind of red zone. We want to try to act now. Um, red is the far end of the spectrum, obviously. Um, so uh, easily enraged, uh, withdrawn, um, absenteeism, so they're not even showing up to work in, anymore. Uh, sleeping patterns are just completely out the window um, and access to resources available. Um, they need to seek some professional help and it is something that we just, we do our best to kind of recognize to make sure that they, we help them in our moment to continue that process for them. Uh, um, the only other thing just to mention with this is just to understand, and I think this is a big misconception right now, um, and has always been with mental health, is just because you get into that red zone, that orange or red or that higher up, it doesn't mean that you can't come back on this, this continuum model. It doesn't mean that you can't come back to yellow or green. Um, and on the flip side, it doesn't mean that that person that's in green can't creep up into the, the higher end or the higher colors as well. Okay, so um, so to bring this all to an end, uh, I just want to finish kind of the same message as, as, as Mike had. Um, look out for each other. Um, turn to the person next to you um, and be there for them and don't be afraid to ask for them to be there for you. Uh, we're living in a really, really strange and really weird time right now, 2020, and uh, uh, everyone is experiencing some form of stress. And again, this isn't just happening to someone else. It's, it's happening to me. It's happening to us at the same time. Um, so Rhiannon, that's, uh, that's all I have there. Um, Mike, I can throw it back to you. We can look at these polls. Perfect. Oh, they disappeared there. Perfect. Sorry, I thought I'd maybe jump the gun there for a second. <laughs> no, 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 you're, you're right on cue. You're right on mark. So that's, that's perfect. So good, so we have the one in five, so everybody has, has learned that. Um, okay, and uh, yeah, we have those increasing numbers, so that's good. So yeah, everybody can kind of see 18 or older, so we're actually sitting at that like 11.6%, so for sure. Oops, sorry, try and hand in the way. Um, yeah, Rhiannon, um, to you and, and uh, you know, before we go back to Mike, um, just want to say thank you. I, I am nervous enough with this technology. I have not jumped into that chat room at all because I'm afraid to touch something wrong and then all of a sudden everything goes, goes away. So uh, just thank you to everybody and, and Michael, I'll, I'll throw it back to you for wrap up. Sure. Uh, yeah, I'm just to echo Chris's sentiments. Uh, again, it was really fun being here for us even though my face might tell a different story um kind of strange sitting here just looking at a, a green light so i apologize you know chris and i you know as we're adjusting to different times too we like to be amongst people and kind of play off one another and pay play off our crowd too but um you know um just really wanted to again say thanks for having us uh a quick just breakdown of if you need to get in touch with us um Chris, obviously, you know, if you have small children that wants to look at the social media, follow him. Um, I typically sort of just swing for the fence on things, and sometimes it pays off, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but um, I think, you know, we ran over time, so if, you know, we have to wrap things up, that's fine. But, I mean, Chris and myself are happy to stick around or offline or if there's any sort of questions that we need to uh, kind of run through or anything like that so but i'll kick it back to you then uh, crystal or rannon and we can kind of go from there sounds good thank you guys so much um that was super informative i think that it's they were all very important topics it's super important for us to be talking about stress during these times heart health mental health um and you guys just brought so much information to the table today and I appreciated all your words and wisdom and your humor. You guys are awesome together. So thank you so much. Um, I want to thank Blue Cross again for their support in ho helping us to host these series. Um, like I said earlier, we want to do this to get the community engaged 
Um, we want people to ask questions. It was awesome to see all the questions in the chat tonight. Um, like I feel it too, it's hard not to be around everyone and we love having these talks in person, but we're faced with having to kind of adapt and as humans, that's what we're gonna do, right? So um, thank you guys for joining us on Zoom. Was great um, and I wanted to let everyone know that our next um, what the health talk will be November 25th so save the date for that um, we're not all gonna sit down at the computer though that time it's going to be a little bit of yoga so make sure that you can see your screen from your mat and um, we'll do some mindfulness and meditation as well so thank you everyone who joined us tonight. It was awesome seeing everyone's faces and hearing the presentations and questions. And we look forward to seeing you all next month. So have a great night, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for putting your information up there, guys. That's great. So anyone can get in contact with Mike or Chris if you like. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Everyone can leave now. And Chris can leave my house, which is a win for me. He... <laughs> no, honestly, you guys. Like... I thought I was staying over. Oh. <laughs> oh, you're in his house. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> there was literally like 50 plus people there right until the end. Like, yeah. you guys did a great job. I was getting messages. A lot of people didn't get the link emailed to them, and they didn't come into their spam and stuff like that, too. So. Hmm. Okay. I yeah. people were joining sort of the whole time. I was like, talking to um, Shannon throughout too, and like we didn't get any bounce backs, so there shouldn't have been any issues with. I kind of was like trying to check that the entire time. So I exported the list of those who didn't get the email, because then maybe we can follow up with a couple that we know, so I can try to tr troubleshoot it for next time. Sure. Yeah, yeah. maybe it's a spam or something, or like a junk mail. Or they're lying to us, Mike. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe follow up and just send it, send them the link. So a couple, couple people, I, Chris, it would have been great if you had looked at the chat too, because there were so many really positive um, comments. Good. You guys did a great awesome. job. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And thank you for helping us with everything and kind of. Yeah, we, we thought it was good. Though. That was okay. So. Yeah. Yeah, it was good. I, interestingly, my, um, our, I have three kids, as you know, and Chris, my youngest, was also born six.